You're listening to Art Affairs, episode 39. Today I'll be talking to Renee French. So my name's Michael Faith, and this is Art Affairs. Art Affairs is my attempt at shining a spotlight on the many wonderful people that make up this amazing art community, featuring conversations with artists, gallerists, curators, telling their stories. You can dig through previous episodes, complete with show notes, at artaffairspodcast.com. But the best way to stay plugged in is to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. And if you're really enjoying the show and want to help support what I'm doing here in an even bigger way, check out the Art Affairs Patreon. Not only does it give you an opportunity to help keep the show going, but there are several community-oriented benefits as well, like getting early access to episodes and suggesting questions for upcoming guests. You can find all the information about that at patreon.com slash artaffairs. You can also connect with the show on Instagram and Facebook at Art Affairs Podcast. All right, so today's guest is artist Renee French. Renee has had a long and successful career as a creator of alternative comics, for which she's even developed quite a David Lynchian-ish cult-like following. But in recent years, she's also started creating paintings for exhibitions in the new contemporary art scene. We talk about this transition from comics into gallery work on the show, as well as how she first got into comics in the first place, what she's been working on lately, and a whole lot more. So I hope you enjoy my conversation with Renee French. Renee, welcome to the show. I'm really happy to have you on. Thank you for having me. All right. And and I guess I'm especially grateful because it's like, you know, 2 a.m. there, which is insane to me that that you're doing a functional thing at at 2 a.m. Yeah, it's one fifty nine a.m. So if my voice is scratchy, that's why. Yeah. And, and I guess um, starting there, I, I, I'm curious because um, you didn't grow up in Australia. So how did you end up in Australia? I guess what led you there? Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, my partner and I used to come here to visit. He has a friend here that's a very, very old friend. Um, and we, we came to visit. And I think we were on, we did a sabbatical in 98 and um for six months and fell in love with it uh sydney especially yeah so that's that was the beginning of it and then we um were going back and forth from california to here and for a while and then just decided well we we decided we wanted to find where we wanted to end up you know where we wanted to live for good um and it just we na- we sort of narrowed it down to a few places, and Sydney was the place we were happiest. So that's where we ended up. Oh, nice. So so it wasn't like a family thing. It was just you just enjoyed Australia, and that's where you wanted to go. Oh yeah, yeah. No, not a family thing. So we're very far away from both of our families. He's he's Canadian. Okay. Um, and I'm from New Jersey. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You you were born in Newark, I believe, and grew up in in central New Jersey. Um, so, what was that area like? What what was the the part of town where you where you grew up? Wow, James Lipton, that was really specific. Um, <laughs> <laughs> central New Jersey. N- yeah, it was cows and grass, and we had a lot of woods around us. And I liked to go into the city as a kid, but my my father didn't like it, and you know, we didn't get in enough. I mean, we, we did go, um, but not enough f- for me. You know, I, I <laughs> that's where I wanted to be all the time. But uh, yeah, we played in the woods mostly, uh, mm-hmm. my brother and I, you know. It was a lot of that tree fort and being in the woods and making up stories and, you know, that kind of thing. The tree that, Mr. Tree that ate all the rocks and you know, <laughs> that that kind of, yeah. It was, it was, we were, we were isolated. Well, that's, that's an interesting contrast. Yeah. Just the, the contrast between the countryside and, and the city, like that, that must've been an interesting experiencing both sides, like both extremes, I guess. 
Yeah, I love the city. It was, yeah. And so as soon as I could, I, I, uh, after university, I went to Philly. My, my friend Lisa and I moved to Philly and lived in a little tiny one room with mattresses on the floor above a pizza place that we couldn't afford pizza. We couldn't afford pizza. We lived there. We were <laughs> scrounging for every dime there. Um, but it, I could not wait to get into a city. It was, this mm-hmm. thing of growing up around, I mean, it was just, it was beautiful. Like if, if I went there now, I would think, oh, it's really beautiful. New Jersey can be beautiful. It's, you know, it's got all those gardens and uh, fields and, you know, amazing tomatoes that I can't get now because <laughs> I'm on the other side of the world and the sweet corn and everything. I mean, there are things I miss about New Jersey, the pizza, which you can't get anywhere else like that so when you had a lot of like a lot of um bunnies and cats and stuff growing up and you would like bring birds home and stuff i mean being in like the countryside did you have a lot of uh, animals around you as a kid that's yeah that's true um yeah we did we did we had a lot of animals bunnies were bunnies were the thing really um we always had rabbits and i like my when i was a kid the memories that i have of the bunnies are so vivid. Like um, my dad uh, built this amazing hutch that was down on the ground. I mean, it was up a bit, you know, for the poop to fall through, but, but it was um, this really big hutch for two bunnies that you, and I used to crawl in there and sit in there with them. I mean, I remember it really vividly. Um, Rabbits are weird, you know, they're, they're not affectionate generally. So they have this, kind of they're aloof but they're not like cats where they don't feel like they've got something better to do it's not like that they're just (laughs) kind of scary even in a way i don't know so cute but so so weird and kind of scary so yeah i i love the bunnies yeah what kind of um work did your your father do i know he worked for ford was he like a factory worker or wow man your research is very impressive um (laughs) (laughs) Um, he, I'm not actually sure what he did. I mean, it's one of those things when, and this was in the early seventies, right? I mean, he, he was one of those guys who would go to work, he'd come home and didn't talk, right? Mm. Very sort of never said anything. Yeah. I don't, I went, I went to his work one time and he sort of brought us around and showed us where he worked, uh, but at the Ford motor plant, but, um, I don't know really what he did. I don't even know what he did. <laughs> but it was it was like an assembly plant? It was the big, yeah, the big sort of the plant where they made mm. the cars, yeah. Interesting. And what kind of work did your mom do? My mom was um, stayed at home with three kids. And um, then she later was, uh, you know, like a secretary and yeah, those kind of jobs, you know. Um, the kind of job that I did when I got out of school um, mm. because I could type. In, in addition to like, um, you know, running around in the woods and, and doing, you know, kid stuff, I know you also drew a lot as a kid. Um, so like, where, where did your interest in art making come from? Like, is that something that you had a lot of exposure to when you were young? Well, my dad, um, my dad's an artist. Um, he, you know, he, that was his job. He worked at Ford, but he was constantly making things. He's not, he's the kind of that that was one of the reasons we never saw him. He would come home and then go into his studio. There were strange things he was making. He's more of a sculptor than a painter or anything. But I did get, I did, I know I got this from him. And I know that if I, I, I think if I had kids, I would not be the best parent uh, because I think I would probably be unavailable, you know, sort of in my own world, in my own place. I do it now all the time. Um, yeah, he would, he would just be in his place and not around anybody. I, I mean, it was, you know, I understand it now. I think as a kid, as a kid, it was kind of like, where is, he's never here. He's never. And even when he's home, he's not here. So I don't mean to be bitching about my dad. That's really horrible. It's really <laughs> horrible. But, but do you think that, I guess, creative side that you saw in him was an influence in some way? I think it was more 
to be honest, I think it was more inherited than anything. Mm. I, I don't think because he was very competitive <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, I, it wasn't like a nurturing kind of thing. It wasn't like he wasn't showing us how to make art or sort of setting an example that way. It wasn't like that. It was almost like, in spite of that or something. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I did it because it was an escape, really. Okay. I mean, from very early on, I figured out that if I did it, I was in another place, you know, in, a, in another world or something. And you also took, I mean, painting lessons really early. I mean, I think five years old, you, which is like yeah. super young. So like, how did how did that come about? Was that something your your mom kind of encouraged you? Yeah, yeah. That was my mom. She, okay. I think what happened was she knew, she saw me when I was little doing that stuff. And she didn't have any of that, right? So my mom was not, is not someone who is artistic, you know, she doesn't really have that. I mean, she's, she says that about herself. It's not, I'm not <laughs> imposing that on her, but, um, she decided that my brother and I should, you know, that she could bring us down to this place and we would have private lessons, um, private painting lessons. And I loved it. It was amazing. I mean, it was doing this illusion, you know, this trick, uh, painting was kind of like, you put down a splooge, a little splooge, and then when you back up, it becomes something, which was really magic. I love that. I really love that. Yeah, that was when I was five. And then my brother didn't stay very long. Um, he was also there. He came the next year when he was five, but he didn't really stay long. And, and was it always like your your desire or your goal to become an artist? Like that Was that a, a, a common thread throughout your childhood? I remember wanting to be a cartoonist. I don't know why that was. Uh, I think because I thought that you could do that as a career. I knew enough to know that from watching TV that you could, you know, be in a, in an office and be at a drawing table and, you know, like on Mary Tyler Moore, there were all these, these guys <laughs> in the background who were at drawing tables who were the art department. And I thought I could do that. I could be a cartoonist and I could, you know, or a newspaper cartoonist or something like that. It seemed like it could be a job. A painter to me was, there would be no way that I would be able to do that because I'm a girl too. So, you know, I'm not going to be taken seriously. That was really clear pretty early on. Um, mm. Women don't, women aren't painters, uh, well, I know, I know in high school that you, you, you made a ton of drawings about like death and people getting stabbed and, and just generally frightening things. Um, I mean, did, did that change your, your mom's support? I mean, was she still supportive even through that period or, or did she get a little bit more concerned? <laughs> no, she was wigged out. I know that she was really, she was concerned. Yeah, she was. I don't, I, I don't have a, like a specific memory about that time about my mom being, upset but i do remember that i i mean i remember <laughs> the feeling of uh i it's probably it was probably so, like comments like can't you do something that's nice or you know <laughs> can't you do something cute or something you know like that mm -hmm. uh yeah but yeah they were pretty grotesque and scary things yeah but when, when it came time to go to college, I guess you still were pursuing art. I mean, it wasn't anything that kind of got in your way or, or that she resisted, I guess, in some way. Because um, you went to, I guess, Cutstown in, in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Um, I guess, why there? Why did you choose Cutstown? I, because my, I had a, a teacher, the high school I went to um, was really progressive. And they were, um, the teachers there were really young. And, and we had a big art department there. We had photography and pottery and um, weaving and departments, though. It wasn't like one art class that had all of these things in it. Um, and my photography teacher there uh, went to Kutztown and talked a lot about the faculty being great there. 
I remember him talking about it and saying, this is a really great art school. It's just, but it's in Amish country and you'd never, you know, it's not, it's not Parsons or something. Um, it just seemed like a nice place. Uh, and I just was the only place I really applied to go. I mean, I, I didn't really, I wasn't really interested in anywhere else. Uh, and I got into the, there was, you had to actually try out for the commercial art department. So I did that. And then I quickly changed once I was there because I realized I really don't like this. It was, it was like, you know, doing a lot of layouts with markers and stuff. And I was, and it was, what with, you know, so I changed to fine art and, um, it was just a time when it was a time to build my portfolio. I, I realized that pretty early on that you're just sort of what you're doing there is just learn, just working all the time, you know, making stuff. But I know you had a pretty influential teacher there, uh, George Sorrells. I hope I'm oh, pronouncing that, that name right. Um, yeah. and, and he sort of became a mentor, I guess. What was it about that um, experience and his instruction that connected with you so much? He, he, he was huge for me. Really early, it, it was sort of, it was my, I guess it was the first year and it was drawing, it was the first drawing class. He was notorious for being really hard, you know, like really tough and people dropping his class in the first week because he was just brutally honest. And he would say things like, what do you do? What do you do when you're not here at school? <laughs> um, oh, well, I'm a farmer. Well, maybe you should do that instead. He was that kind of guy, <laughs> right? It was like, and the people would, oh, in the back, oh, and then they wouldn't, they would drop the course. Um, I loved him. Like right from the very beginning, I thought this guy He's great. And then his work, he did these like tiny little, oh my God, they were these like beautiful, excruciating little worlds with like human par- body parts and trees, tiny little trees. And they were, he was, he would do like silver point, teeny tiny. And then also, um, little paintings teeny tiny little paintings, same thing, very soft, very transportive, you know, just, yeah. So he was very influential uh, for me. I always thought like, I always felt special when he was talking to me, you know, that kind of guy, that kind of person. I still think about, I still think you have his voice in my head a lot, you know, when I work. Uh, that's awesome. That's awesome. So ultimately, in, in 86, you, you graduated with a BFA in drawing. Uh, do you feel that overall, I mean, it sounds like just from the experience with George that it was a, a rewarding or fulfilling experience. But I guess is that overall, was art school something that you feel is necessary in your development as an artist? I think for me, what it was was getting away from home. And then there were people there that were like George and uh, a few other professors who were very important to me, you know, important to the way I I looked at life more than anything. I think the, I probably would have made the work anyway. Um, but having the time was the thing. Like if I kids, if kids ask now about whether they should go to art school or not, I, I kind of feel like it's about the getting away and going somewhere and hanging out with different people. You know, not the usual people you're with, not your family and sure. that kind of thing. So, okay. Um, Interesting. And so you mentioned earlier that, that it was after school that, that you went to Philly, um, you know, to kind of get more of the city atmosphere. Uh, what kind of work were you doing when you, when you first got out of school? Well, I'm a huge film, film fan. So, um, I worked at a art house movie theater, you know, with a little bow tie in the, um, selling tickets. Uh, and at a toy store, you know, like that kind of thing, art supply store. And then I got a bunch of sort of series of photography jobs, like, um, printing color at a custom place. Um, I worked for a forensic photographer, um, interesting people like that, but they were, it was kind of quick succession of those kind of jobs. And then I ended up in real estate, in corporate real estate, doing, um, you know, graphics at a corporate real estate place. So it ended up being a sort of, I was in an office job because I thought, I sort of figured out that for me, it was important to have health insurance 
and a stable job. And then I could go home and do my comics. Okay. Interesting. So, I mean, I guess um, before you got into comics, were you still making drawings and, and were you still able to kind of focus on your art outside of the day job activities that you were doing? I was doing little, yeah, I was, I mean, I was consistently making stuff because I, I didn't, it's sort of, I had to do it. I was, I make me feel crazy if I wasn't doing it. So I was making very tiny little, little scenes, you know, um, in colored pencil and, uh, watercolor and, you know, same things I was doing in school, um, but not showing them anywhere. Okay. So, I mean, obviously, you know, you've had a, a, a pretty, you know, long and successful career in comics. So how did that start? I mean, I, I know uh, from reading up, um, you know, in, in your, your childhood, you didn't really have uh, much exposure. You didn't really get into comics at that point. So when did, when did you actually become interested in comics as a medium? Okay. So I was, I married this writer uh, when I worked at the movie theater and um, it was not a lasting relationship. Um he was a writer and he was into comics. He liked comics. So uh, we actually tried, we opened a comic book store for, uh-huh. and we only were there for a year or so um, because we had a lot of competition. Uh, we didn't really know what we were doing business wise. <laughs> I was 23 ish. And um, yeah, so it was called basement of the Alamo and it was uh cute little place and the idea was we could sell the art comics but then everyone who would come in would say do you have x-men and (laughs) it was this thing where we were like do we start carrying x-men but then if we have x-men we have to have all the dc and all the marvel (laughs) and all the everything so it was a you know it was an education we went out of business pretty quickly um sold all of our stuff to the local place and uh, but in the meantime, um, I saw a bunch of comics like Julie Desay and, um, Chester Brown and just like, uh, Raw Magazine and those things. I kind of, I thought, well, it was really interesting. These people were making this, this stuff that was like really gritty art. It was a lot like what I was making, except it was stories. And my stuff was already sort of narrative in its, it would be a story within one frame. You know, there were usually a lot of elements going on in the, in the frame. Um, so I just kind of, I made the leap into it. I, I, I taught myself how to, I, you know, I read a bunch of alternative comics and tried to learn the language and it was tough. And my husband at the time, um, would write the stories and then I would illustrate them. But that didn't last long because then we split up and I did my own, I did my own stories. So, um, and then Fanagraphics gave me a one shot or it was a three shot. You know, so I guess as you started to transition into comics, did you have to change your your style or artistic approach uh, at some way that to make it more suitable for comics? It sounded like you already had you, you said you already had a narrative kind of approach in general anyway. Um, but did you had to have to develop that kind of consciously for it to be you know appropriate for comics? Yeah, I think that I think what helped me, I did have to adapt it for sure because comics are so like film, like they are, you have to, it's, it's actually really difficult. Once you start to do it, you realize there's a lot of things like, like one of the things is, oh, I have to draw the same character over and over again. And I, it needs to be clear that that's the character. That's something that you don't, if you're doing a story in one panel, have to worry about, um, this character. So I, he has a mustache or something, right. And he needs to be, it, it needs to be clear that this guy with the mustache is the same guy with the mustache later on. If you have a very simple style, you know, that's not, it's easier, a bit easier. If you draw like a, I did, which was lots of cross hatching and lots of crazy marks, it becomes this kind of difficult puzzle, you know, how, how do I make this to the reader look like the same character? That's a difficult problem. It's way more 
challenging than it seems to be, you know, um, that, and you don't even realize it's a problem until you try to tell a story, um, that kind of thing. Um, also pacing and, uh, make sure that the audience knows what's happening here. It's, it's, that's again, if it's not with dialogue, it, it's, it's kind of tricky. So yeah, there was a lot of stuff that, I don't know, I had to figure out myself. Um, I didn't really look at, I wasn't really looking at other comics to learn it either. It was more like figuring it out myself was kind of the fun of it. The puzzle of it was fun. Yeah. Well, and you also worked, I mean, a little bit later, you worked with uh, Penn Gillette, who I, I believe is is a longtime friend of yours, um, and, yeah. and even introduced you to your husband, Rob, I believe. Uh, how, how did how did that come about that you guys ended up crossing paths? Because that seems like very different worlds that y'all kind of come from. Well, as he says, it's all one show business. <laughs> Every, it's all one show business. I mean, juggling, acting, dancing, art, it's all one thing. I think he's right in that. Um, we met because, uh, <laughs> um, we met at a signing. I went to get, uh, I went to get an autograph, you know, in a, in a, at a book signing and had a little conversation with Penn. And then, um, later, uh, I sent him my, my first, my sort of, uh, self-published comics um, the, the first ones, uh, it was called sociopath and, um, uh, he, and he really liked it. And then he called, he actually, I, I sent it to his office and he called me and, um, <laughs> that was like, that blew my mind because I just, I <laughs> sent it cause I thought he might like it because it was kind of gross. You know, I, I thought he might like that kind of thing anyway. Um, and then uh, later on, I was doing, um, I was starting a, a bigger book and I needed a title for it. And I also wanted a forward for it. And I thought, oh, maybe Penn would do a forward for me. Um, I may, you know, I could ask him. So I, I called the office and left a message and he actually got back to me and that was when email was just starting up. That's how <laughs> long ago this was. Uh, w- and we were like, cool. Cause we had email, right? I mean, do you have the email? Um, do you have that thing, that email thing? So, um, yeah, I contacted him, asked me, he was like, yeah, sure. Uh, and then we became really good. F- we just really, we became really good friends after that, like pretty quickly and talked on the phone all the time. And nice. you know, it was, Yeah. And then later, and then later, I met Rob through him. We were mutual friends, and um, yeah, we hit it off. So awesome! And so you guys collaborated on a book um, as well. Do you like collaborating with people in general? I don't really at all. No, um, but I mean, it's it's really yeah. It's it's kind of um, I'm just I think I'm really difficult. Uh, I don't want. I don't like to collaborate because I I realize as, as I get older too, I kind of realize what it is. The reason it's that the enjoyment I get out of making stuff is not the finished product. It's the getting there and it's the figuring it out. It's the puzzle of it. And the, I like to walk around with a problem in my head and figure it out, you know, as the day goes on and, I like to just always have some kind of puzzle going on. And if I'm working with someone, I I cannot, I don't have it in me. I really don't. It's horrible. It's real. It's a character flaw. I don't have it in me to take an idea that someone has and incorporate it in what I'm doing. Mm. I just, it is not part of my makeup. I just, and I feel like a horrible person <laughs> because someone will, I mean, just, I'm hanging out with my friends or whatever. And I, what are you working on, Renee? And I say, Oh, I'm working on this thing about donkeys or something. And oh, how about if the donkey, if someone gives me an idea, I have to not ever do it. So when someone says, well, what about the donkey? What if the donkey's made of cotton candy? I have to say, 
well, that is gone now. I can't, that's, you know, I mean, I don't say that to the person, but the, <laughs> but like it's, it bugs me in a way that's, yeah, it's just really, yeah. As they say here, it shits, it shits me. It shits me to tears, man. Man. Well, and didn't, I mean, in that same vein, didn't you completely rewrite something because it had a floating circus? I think I'm trying to recall the story because there, and then another book that came out around the same time had a floating circus. You're like, oh, I can't do that now. I got to go redo this whole thing. Ted Stern. Yeah. Ted okay. Stern inadvertently stole my idea. No, I stole his. Um, no, we had a, uh, one of those, uh, parallel, um, we came to the same idea at the same time without talking to each other about it. Right. Um, so it was, ap- you know, it was, <laughs> yeah. Um, that was the ticking. That was, um, yeah, that was the ticking. I did. I had a, I had this beautiful, like, <laughs> I remember just, you know, many, many nights lying in bed thinking about this floating circus that's going to come to the island where Edison Steelhead lives and the floating circus will take him away. And it, it's going to be floating on the water and have these like lights. It'll be reflected. It'd be just this really beautiful, weird thing. And then I went and I was giving a slide lecture at that amazing art school in Baltimore that I can never remember the name of. Um, Micah? Um, yeah, Micah. Is it? Yeah. And Ted Stern was there also. Ted Stern was there. We were, and we were, the night before the lecture, we were at a bar and I was talking to Ted and and he said something about this floating circus. He was telling me about his story and it had a floating circus. And I was like, fuck, <laughs> no, what? Oh, no. And I remember him saying, well, that's fine. We can both have floating circuses in our stories. Why can't we both have floating? No, I can't do it. So anyway, that was, yeah. So then I just took it out. I eliminated it. I, I got rid of the mother in the story. Like, I <laughs> I completely, uh, yeah, but it turned out good. I mean, I like how it turned out. So, right on. yeah. Yeah. I mean, you ended up getting nominated for several awards and actually won an Inkpot award for that, for that book. Yeah. So um, good thing I got rid of that thing. <laughs> but, maybe yeah. it would have been my downfall. <laughs> well, and I know you've said in the past that you don't like to really focus on how your audience receives your work. And it's more about, I guess, how you, you know, work through a problem or something. Uh, and I guess, so being of that mindset, does like, how does it feel to be recognized in these ways and to receive these kinds of accolades when your focus really wasn't on about how people receive it in the first place? <laughs> well, I don't. I of course I love. I I mean I I I love when it when my work touches somebody. That's like the the best feeling is when somebody says, "Oh my god, that story! I related so much to that story, and it, it made." it made me happy or made me sad or whatever. I mean, I, I love that feeling. I'm not, I don't make anything for the audience specifically because if I do that, I feel like it, it ends up being not true, right? It's being making, if you make something that's just true to yourself, you just make it because you have to make it. You just true to your own kinks or whatever. Um, other people are going to get something out of it. It's just, it just happens. If you think about what the people want and you try to do it, it doesn't work. I don't know. I don't really even know why, but it just, it, it, it's, it, it feels not honest or something, mm-hmm. right? Isn't like an authenticity thing? Yeah. I think it's just, it's, yeah, it's not as human if you're, eh, human's not the right word, but yeah. Yeah, it is about authenticity, I think. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Well, and and I guess, um, you know, uh, adult oriented stories aren't the only kind of books that you make. You also have have created several kids' books as well. Under um, Some of them have been under a pen name, Rainy Doheny, I think is how mm-hmm. you pronounce the way that's spelled, which I love the, the rhyme <laughs> of that. Um, and then a recent one under your own name. I, I guess, how did, how did children's books start with you? Like, how, what got you interested in creating books for kids? Well, I was just going to say it was a mistake, but it's not a mistake. <laughs> um, the reason was because I, I, I thought, I thought that the artwork could be bigger. 
right? It was kind of like making comics, but bigger, like bigger, big, full page illustrations. You know, that's, that would be really fun to make a book that was covered completely in drawing would be really fun. Um, yeah, it was, it wasn't, it was, that's what it was appealing to me. I also loved as a kid, Maurice Sendak. And I think that his stuff was so, his stuff was, ex, you know, extremely authentic, right? I mean, I, I think he just, I feel like he was just making that directly from his brain and heart, just on the paper, boom, right? And not, not thinking about, I don't really think he was thinking about the kids who were going to be <laughs> looking at it. I think he was more making it for himself, actually. And then it turned out that it, they were just amazing books. But yeah, so for me, it was, it just seemed like a really nice format, you know, double page spreads, blah, blah, blah. But I wasn't anticipating how difficult it would be to work with the editors and have them sort of pulling back on everything, right? All the time, sort of, you know, that's too weird. That's too weird. That's too weird. That's too weird. That's like, that was the mantra, you know, just as too weird. No, it's too weird. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then after I did, I, so I did two picture books for Simon and Schuster, Athenaeum, uh, Ann Schwartz, and, and then Francoise Mouly came to my table at, uh, one of the comic conventions I was at. And, um, I was just like starstruck, right? Oh my God. She's the lady who decides who goes on the New Yorker covers, right? That's like the dream job of any kid who's grows up on the East coast in the United, United States and is an art person, right? Like, oh my God, to, to do an, a New Yorker cover. It's just like the dream. So, um, she came over to talk to me and gave me her card and, said that she was doing kids books and may, she would really like it if I would think about doing one. Right. And so I did <laughs> do one. <laughs> I did do one and I got to go, uh, I got to go to the New Yorker offices, which was just this like dream come true, right. To see the New Yorker offices and to see all of those, there's a wall of um, New Yorker covers. And mm. I don't know, it was just this really dreamy experience and made a book with Francoise and got to work with her and it was unforgettable and amazing. Um, and it's a weird book. It's, it's really a weird book. Um, but anyway. Was that hard to transition? I mean, in the same way that you kind of had to transition your early artwork and to be suitable for comics, was it hard to also transition from, you know, doing some of these more adult oriented themed comics to creating books for kids and something that's more, I guess, appropriate for younger ages. I mean, not, not, well, the difficult thing for me always is to, I, I'm kind of blind to the creepy part of my work. Like I don't, it's not really that intentional ever. It's, it's um things that I think are cute that I make many times, just the reaction to them are, is, that's gross or that's creepy. And I, and I swear, I, th I think it's cute. You know, like I don't, I, I it's, it's hard for me to see it. I'm kind of blind to what looks scary or creepy about it. Um, so that was tricky because I would make something that I thought was just a cute thing. And then I, the feedback I would get is that's too strange, rain it back. And I, I kind of can't see it, you know, I, I kind of can't see what part of it <laughs> is creepy or weird. Um, so that's the difficult part for me. Okay. Not the storytelling as much, you know, that was, that's okay. Um, and I like to write dialogue. So dialogue is, you know, nice, fun for me. I like that. Okay. Are, are, are you able to kind of work on those two different sides of your career at the same time? Like, is that... I have to imagine that context switching can be a little difficult, but um, do you have to kind of have this kind of formal separation between them? I think I like it actually. I, I think I'm kind of all over the place by design because 
it's it, it's stimulating, you know? It's like um I don't it's not that I could get bored, but I I hit a I usually hit a wall. I have this thing. I heard some one of your other interviews that somebody said this. It might have been Allison, oh, maybe not. Um that I get to a point I do something and then I get to to a point and then I detest it, right? Like, so, <laughs> <laughs> like, um, like I'll t- be telling stories, right? And using dialogue. And then the next book would be, I would just detest any kind of dialogue or storytelling or the very thing that I do, right? So, I'd hit this weird wall where I was like, I just hate it. I hate to tell stories, but that's what exactly what I'm doing, right? So Mm. this weird push, pull and pushy thing where I'm, what exactly am I doing? And I fight through it, fighting myself and come out the other end, pooped out as something else, right? Like um, it's, oh, suddenly there's this other thing, like the kid's book thing or – um. Yeah. Or when I made H day, which was like a book about migraines, my migraines, there's no storyline there. It's like a puzzle. It's like a, a puzzle pieces fit together because I didn't want any narrative. Like, cause I just decided that, that, that I hated narrative all of a sudden. Uh, I think it's putting up barriers. I think it's kind of like putting hurdles in front of myself on purpose without knowing it. Right. Interesting. If I put these hurdles here, I have to hop over them and it makes it more stimulating for me. It makes it more challenging. Always the most challenging way to do something <laughs> is the way to do it. I don't, you know, that's I why I love that when perspective. They, yeah. Kids that I have some kids who I um talk to like in DM in Instagram DMs, like sort of, uh, just talking to them, kids who make art, right? Just the art kids. And the question is always about many, many times it's about how to get to the end, right? Um, I'm making this thing. Uh, how do I get to the end of it? How do I finish it? Why can't I finish it quicker? Or how long is it going to take me to be able to make something that looks good? Like they're very, they're in a rush, they're always in a rush. Mm. And the thing that my thing is put as many barriers in front of you as you can to slow yourself down, to make it about the barriers and jumping over the barriers instead of the end. But that's a really weird concept, right? But it, it's kind of like the finished product is just an artifact. It's not actually, it, it's not, it's not, it's a means to an end in a way. It's a, it's a, it's not the end. Does that make any sense? No, it totally does. And it's funny, you know, uh, you, hearing you talk about that, it reminded me of the conversation that I had with Jaw Cooper's, you know, in an episode we did several months ago and the teaching of teachings of Alan Watts and Alan Watts um, taught quite a lot about how you shouldn't focus on the end that the destination isn't the thing that it's the journey to get to that destination that is the thing and you should focus on that and appreciate that and if you if you try so hard to reach some end that might or might not be you know it ends up leading to anxiety and depression and rather than doing that and and losing sight of the now and the moment um you know appreciate the journey and appreciate the you know, challenges and the things that you have to overcome to get there, because that's the real, that's the real stuff, you know? Totally. Yeah, totally. It's about the, it is about the journey. Yeah. I mean, that's how everybody says it. It's it's true. It's, if you don't enjoy that, you're not going to make it either because there's so much labor in it, in making art that, you know, I just, I, it's, there's just too much labor to not love that part of it. You have to love it. Yeah. And, and so I guess fast forwarding a little bit in 2011, um, you know, you talked about each day, you actually had a, uh, a gallery show in New York following the release of that book, which featured some of your, your graphic drawings or graphite drawings rather, um, that you'd created for the novel or for the graphic novel. Um, 
which, which I think is sort of an interesting thing because it, it sort of takes things that were meant for one purpose and puts them in an entirely different sort of atmosphere. Um, I, I guess, was that your first time showing, you know, your comic work in a gallery setting or had you done that before? That I think I had a show like in the back of Meltdown comics uh, probably before that, but a little show. That was before the comedy club was back there. Meltdown's not there anymore. This is in Los Angeles. And, but it was, yeah, it was a little show. I think that was before that, but it was definitely the first time I ever had my comic book pages on a wall like that. And that was all of them. That was actually the entire book in order. It was a pretty cool show, but no one came, right? It was one of those ones where, you know, a few of my friends, you know, it was the occasional critic y person, uh, but not not many people were there. Which, you know, it's that I didn't really understand why you'd want to exhibit at that point, because that my experience was all always no one comes to these things, you know. You're standing there awkwardly for a couple hours, you know, like what do I do? It's yeah. I mean, I've since then I I understand it more. Um having had more shows and having had, you know, not had an empty room like that. It's, it's kind of fun. Was that always the the plan for that book? Like going into it? Or is it something you kind of came up with after the fact? No, it really wasn't. It was that, uh, Adam Baumgold in New York. Um, so my friend, Scott Teplin, who is an amazing artist. If you, I mean, if you don't follow him, you should, you should follow him for sure. He's, he's just, Amazing. He just, his stuff, speaking of somebody who just puts their brain out there on the paper, that's Scott. Scott Teplin was showing with Adam Baumgold and he just, he, I think he mentioned my work to him and got, you know, sort of was the person who got me in there. And Adam would show my work in group shows and stuff. And that was, then it was, the question was, how can we do a solo show? And it just seemed like the thing to do, you know? Well, we could put all of these, all of these drawings up, you know, like in order. Yeah. Um, and, and even outside of your comic work, I, I believe you had already started showing, you know, just some of your graphite drawings that were unrelated to to your your comics in group shows. So I guess when did you start, you know, first start branching out of your comic work and into the gallery setting? Right. So it wasn't abrupt. I mean, there was like an overlap, but there was a definite kind of like I was saying before, where it just kind of breaks, like I hit a wall and it breaks. There was one of those moments for me. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I was doing my last two books, uh, um, or was finishing my last two books, I think, um, which were uh, Hegelbarger and That Nightmare Goat. That was for Yam Books, which was Rina Ayuyang, um, really cool little publisher. And Annie Koyama, Koyama Press, I did um, Baby Bjornstrand for her. And those two books were like, were finished, I think, at the time. I, I might have my timeline wrong. I'm really bad at timelines. But there, I had had four pieces in a show at La Luz de Jesus, which in LA, and they sold, which was new for me. And then the curator there or the gallerist said offered me a show because he was like because they sold really quickly and he said well why don't we do a show uh and it was this was like (laughs) that was something about that one in particular i think because it was la i liked the way the la art scene was i liked the lowbrow artwork scene scene there and the the people there were really nice. I just, I liked it. So I was really excited about it. New York was more stodgy, you know, was more sort of old fashioned and like not as open to new stuff. So yeah, um, that's what happened that it was that I sold four pieces in a group show. And then I was offered a solo show based on that. Nice. And, and that was it. Yeah. Then for me, I had this like chick, like this turn, which was, and I remember saying it to my friends, like, oh, now I get it. You just make stuff 
<laughs> you make whatever you want and they don't have to actually be, they don't have to tell a story and you know, you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to deal with an editor or any of that stuff. You can just make whatever you want to make. It was a revelation for me. Mm. And I, I did get a lot of you idiot, of course, like what's wrong with you? <laughs> That's awesome. I um, mean, and if I understand like the timeline correctly, it, it was like four or five years after that H Day show um, that you really started to kind of get into painting um, uh, again. I guess if you count the time that you you spent as a kid, um, which you know I think is is interesting because I found uh, an article or, or an interview rather that you did in two thousand six where you were talking about those paintings paintings that you made as a kid and and were. And I'm going to just quote you here. It said, okay. when, I look, when I look back on those things, I think, oh, man, I wish I could paint like that. I can't paint anymore. I'm too tight to paint now. I would really love to be able to oil paint because I could loosen up a bit. And then 10 years later, you actually did exactly that yeah. and started to paint. Yep. Um, so I, I guess what led to you picking up the paintbrush and, and kind of challenging yourself like that? Um, yeah. Wow. Did I say that? Um <laughs> But it sounds, I mean, that's exactly right. Because I I didn't actually think I'd ever be able to do it again. Because like I said, like I said, I'm really too tight. Yeah, because I was doing, because I was doing everything I did was like minuscule little pencil things with like a 0.3 millimeter tip, right? I mean, I'm, these were like, and then in Japan, I got a 0.2 millimeter, which was like a hair, Um and that's what I was doing. It was way too, oh my God, just the teeniest little thing. The idea of taking a brush and putting paint on it and blobbing it on the canvas was like so far from what I was doing um, at the time. So what happened was I just, there was a mixture of things. It was being in Australia. It was being in Sydney where painting is like uh, respected and people actually know who the painters are here. Like regular people know who the painters are, which is different from what I'm used to, you know, or what in, in the U S it, it feels different. Um, that, and I just, I don't know. I just, it was one of those things where I just kind of thought, okay, I've done it now with graphite. Like I've, that's graphite. I've done it. Like I couldn't do it anymore. I love it. I absolutely love graphite, but yeah, I felt like I knew exactly what was going to happen every time I started a drawing. Mm. I knew how it was going to end. You know, it was no more figuring anything out. I, I had figured it out the the way I was working, which was on this ridiculous paper with the tiniest pencil. <laughs> it was the, really ridiculous, but really, it was really... um rewarding at the time, you know, while I was doing it. So I, th I just needed a challenge. So I thought, why don't I do the thing that I'm terrified of? Um, paint. Yeah. And then just taught myself, um, instead of, I went to some classes here, some atelier classes, you know, took the atelier kind of classes here. And I, they helped me sort of feel, get rid of the fear of it, I think. Um, but then I did end up sort of figuring out my own method, you know, the the way that I wanted to work, um, sure. which is kind of classic, the classic, you know, I do start with the ground of, you know, raw sienna or something underneath. And then I, I do bring out the tonal stuff first before I put in the colors and stuff. I do that, that kind of thing. But um, I did, I did really sort of teach myself, try to, it, because it was part of the puzzle of it. Right. Yeah. I needed to do that. <laughs> I need to do that. Now, that's interesting how, how these kind of advancements in your career were more or less just wait. You were bored of, or bored or kind of set with what you were doing before and wanted something new, something to challenge you. Um, because like you said, the figuring it out was the rewarding aspect of it. So I think that's interesting. Um, and I know that you mentioned earlier that, that you, a lot of the comic work that you, you do is, is very small. Um, you know, uh, so I guess was that, um, difficult to like go at a larger scale to, to start. I mean, you know, your, your paintings are you're a little bit larger than I, I think your, your pencil drawings were like two by three. They were you know, super tiny. Um, and your paintings are a bit larger than that. So I guess, what was that like? Um, they're not that much larger though. They're like they're, six, uh, six inches. I mean, it's, it's a little bit larger. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're, we're making progress. <laughs> six is the biggest, right? Like 
four. They were mostly like four, four inches by four inches. Yeah. They're the majority of them are four by four, four by four inches. And then I do have done six by six, but six is, was the big size, right? Six inches, which is, it's very tiny. Um, until, until I made the mistake, uh, of ordering, uh, a canvas that, a uh, linen c- canvas that was, um, I thought 72 centimeters, like when I ordered it, it was 72 centimeters. And, and then, uh, the, then they, and the art store said, well, we can deliver it to your apartment. And I was like, why, why can't you just send it to me? I, it's 72 inches uh, and 72 centimeters. And, um, and then it arrived and it was six feet tall <laughs> and six feet wide. Uh, and, and it, it was enormous. I mean, I, I went from doing six inches, six inch, six inch by six inch to six feet by six feet <laughs> in, in one. It was just like, boom, they had this huge canvas. And so I painted it, the, I painted one of, you know, one of my creatures on that giant canvas. It was really fun. It was like, I, oh my, it was a completely different experience. It was really fun. And I have that thing. Of course, it's still with me. Um, sure. I have not sold, sold it. It's, it's very big. Um, uh, so complete yeah. extremes. Like you don't even transition. Yes. It's just, I'm going to do no. two inches and then I'm going to do six feet. Yes. <laughs> but because it was an accident, um, I would not have done that like that. It was something that was extreme and, but it was exciting. You know, once I, once it arrived, I wasn't going to, Oh, I'm going to cut this into a lot of pieces. It was, um, yeah. Interesting. I've got to do it. So ultimately in, in 2018, you had a, a solo show at Baynard Gallery there in, in Australia. Um, I guess, how did that show come together? And how did you connect with John and, and the folks at Baynard? John wrote me on Instagram and said, I think that's what happened. John, he wrote me and said, would you be interested in doing a show? And I I said yes right away because um, the other person that I would be sharing the space with was, um, oh no, Hattori. Um, Neoto? Yes. Um, and, you know, I mean, he's amazing. And yeah. I remember John saying at the time, because he thought this was true, he said, he's going to be here. And so that was it for me. I'm like, oh my God, can I actually meet this guy? Because I want to meet this guy. Um, he didn't actually show up to the opening, but that, that was okay. So, um, yeah, that's how it came together. Um, what year was that? Did you say, you know, the year 2018 It was a few years ago. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Um, that was the, yeah, that was the last show, but then it was kind of like COVID happened, you know, COVID happened. So we were, you know, every, everybody's every, everything stopped. So I was going to have a show here in Sydney because then my friends could come and it would be this party. Um, but you know, COVID. So, yeah. Um, so I guess as you kind of took up painting, um, why did you ultimately go with acrylic? Or are there aspects about um, acrylic paint that you like more than oil? Oh, yeah. Um, it dries, right? I mean, it, it's, I like that it dries, right? Because you can, um, you can do this thing. The way I paint anyway is that um, I kind of have like a... I water it down, not, not too watery. It's not like watercolor or anything. It's more like, but it's very liquid, the acrylic. And then I, um, I paint, you know, little lines and then they, then they're a layer. And then the next one is a layer and a layer and a layer. And if I had to wait for the oil paint to dry, it would just take me a year (laughs) to make a painting because there's so many little hatches. I paint more like you would with gouache, I think, Mm. you know, gouache, I did a lot of gouache when I was in school and it was about tiny little marks, you know, little tiny little. Yeah. I guess as you're developing an idea for a piece, um, do you do a lot of sketching beforehand? Like does that process differ a lot from the way that you would develop ideas and characters for your comic works? It It's really different because with the paintings, I just paint them. I don't, I mean, I, <laughs> I just, um, I used, I would, I would do, um, 
uh, live sessions on Instagram where I would just have the thing, just, you know, have the board. It has Rossiana on it. And then I would just go into it and no pencil, no nothing, just sort of mm. draw it with the brush, you know, and just kind of do it. So it was very loose. It's very loose. Oh, wow. Yeah. I haven't done a painting in a while because I hit a wall. This, I mean, I, uh, I'm, what happened was I was selling most of my stuff and my studio ended up really empty and I had nothing to really bounce off of. Right. I didn't have actual paintings to look at anymore. And so, uh, I don't know. I went through this weird, another one of these transitions where I was just kind of, you know, I just, I was like, I don't, every time I'd sit down to make another painting, I'd start it and I'd get this, Oh no, yeah, this kind of, I've done it, you know, like I'm done with it. I not, not done with painting, but I'm taking a break from painting. Um, so I started doing animation and then I, and also I've now got, I've turned my studio into a printmaking studio now. So I'm going back to printmaking, which I haven't done in many years. It does seem like I'm all over the place, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah. The paintings are on hold for now. Yeah. So, um, you know, I sim- similar to the way that your your comics are often, you know, like we talked about earlier, this sort of combination of of cute and creepy. Um, uh, you know, the characters that you paint also tend to have this interesting mix of of sweet and cute, but also stressed out, anxious, maybe pensive a little bit. <laughs> um, is that is, is that sort of a juxtaposition, a conscious, intentional thing? Or, I mean, it sounds like earlier you, you weren't even really aware in a lot of ways of of the way that some of that creepiness in, you know, came into it. Um, so is that just how that kind of organically develops for you? Yeah, I don't think it's not. I do know that it's not intentional. It, it, it's not intentional in that way. Like, I don't think I'm going to make this thing cute and creepy, though I know that that's that's the mix. It seems to be the mix for me. It's more like I'm going to do a chihuahua. What qualities of the chihuahua can I bring out and still have the chihuahua-ness of it be there? So like what, how far can you pull out the things that make something what they are before it breaks. Interesting. So, right? So like the, so the eventually the like the arms, the little tiny arms with a little paw on the end there becomes like a like a like a weird little hot dog with a and then the the folds of skin where it hits the body become more foldy, right? But how far can you push that foldiness and that bulginess and stuff before <laughs> it becomes not a chihuahua anymore? That's kind of what, that's my thinking, right? That's, that's what the thinking is. The thinking isn't like how gross or like, can I make this scary or creepy or gross or whatever, or ultra cute. It's more that, I don't know. Oh, wow. That's fascinating. I haven't really thought about that that way. Um, I guess how much depth of, uh, do these characters end up having for you, um, you know, for your painted characters? Like, do you build out stories around them in the same way that you develop, you know, characters in your comics? Like, are these fully developed characters in your, in your mind? Well, they, for sure they're characters. I mean, for sure they're, they're beings, right? They with, yeah, I mean, they are, they don't have, I don't think they have stories though. I mean, I can't think of any that really have a story. Yeah, no. So no, they don't have a story, but they do. They are living. (laughs) Like to me, they are apps. They totally are living. I mean, I do. And I, um, I think of them as real. I mean, that's kind of, it sounds crazy, but they are kind of real characters, right? Each of them. Yeah. Sure. sure. And, and I know that, and you mentioned this earlier about your H day book being um, largely about the migraines that you've, you've, you've suffered with throughout your life. Is that, is that still something you struggle with even today or has that gotten better? Oh yeah. No, it's no, it's not better. Um, yeah. I mean, they are, they're like at least one or two a week. They're pretty bad. 
Um, but it's, yeah, I've had them since I was like 12. So they're, it's something I just, yeah, they're just part of my life. Has that influenced your gallery, like some of these paintings at all in the same way that you, that bled into the themes of your comics? Has it bled into the, some of the themes of your painted works? Yeah, for sure it is. Yeah. I mean, yeah, for sure. So like, um, and I do have friends or I have a friend, Erica, where she, if I post a, a painting or a drawing of a character and I, that I did when I have a headache or, or not really, I can't really draw when I have a headache, but around it, you know, sort of before it and after and stuff. She can tell, right? Interesting. She like sends me a message. <laughs> Are you having it? Are you okay? Um, yeah. But it does come out for sure. It does. Yeah. It does come out. What is your, your working environment like when you're painting? Do, do you have a dedicated studio space? Because obviously, you know, working a little bit larger and with the tools needed to mix paints and the easel and stuff like that, it's different than just drawing, you know, with a pencil. Well, I don't anymore because it's now, excuse me, holding a printing press, but I have a table that has like a tilted up surface. So it's kind of like, it's like a, it's more like a, um, a draft, a draftsman's table, right? Um, like you have an architect's table. Um, and then I would just tape, tape it down the board, tape the painting down and then work on that with a, a lamp over top. So, and then I also, you like my paints are just in a little, uh, watercolor tray, which I go through, right? Like I throw them away because they, they end up, I can't separate the paint from the tray at, so, at some point <laughs> once I use it enough. So I've got a bunch of really old ones. Um, and I use that so that I can actually, you know, if you're using acrylic, it dries like it just dries. It's like instant, right? So I have these little, I wet, I'd have a little eyedropper with water in it and I put it over top of the paints to keep it a little bit wet. And then I close the watercolor tray around it. So it does keep them uh, wet a little bit, you know, like it's, it, they do dry out really fast, but it keeps them wet enough that I can at least, you know, take a sip of coffee or whatever and not, and not have the entire palette dry. Uh, so yeah, but that's it. It's a very small space. And I, and I, I did do a painting on my lap. I mean, that's how small, yeah, I just have like a drawing board with a tape down and then I can do it. Well, and you said there's a printing press there now. So what kind of printing are you getting up to? Is it screen printing, etching? What's the... So I used to do intaglio like dry point and hard ground and stuff like that. Um, so I decided, what have I not done? What's the most difficult printing process, intaglio <laughs> printing process? I'm going to try that because why not? So mezzotint, which is, which is just... It's mental. It's kind of, you know, you rock the plate with a million gazillion. You take this like blade that's curved and you rock that blade and it has little uh, pointy things all along the blade and you rock it hundreds and hundreds and hundreds for hours and hours and hours. You rock it all over the plate so that you get burrs up on the whole metal plate on the copper plate. And that's a black and then what you do is you work into that with a scraper and a burnisher and you bring up the light colors and it's so time consuming <laughs> and so difficult. Um, and I love it cause it's, I don't have it at all. I mean, I've, I pulled a couple proofs yesterday and I'm getting something that's almost an image now. Um, but, uh, it's, yeah, because you have all these like variables, like, is your ink too soft? Is, is your press not, uh, enough pressure? Are you wiping it too much or too little? Um, there's, they're just, you know, is the paper too wet? <laughs> there, there are uh, like lots of variables that can screw it up. So I really like it. It's, um, I'm just, I'm going to figure it out. Oh, that's awesome. That's very cool. And I guess, will you eventually try to do something with that as far as like uh, exhibiting it or doing a show or what's? Yeah, that's the plan. 
if I can do it, I'm, my fallback is dry point. Um, if I, because I love that because hatching, cross hatching and stuff for me is, you know, I mean, I just love it. And I, and I have that as a fallback. If, if I can't get this mesotint, which I'm going to try, I'm just going to really try to get it. Um, but if I can't make something that's worth showing, then, you know, I will, I probably at some point I'll just go, okay, I, I, I know what I'm doing. If I do dry point etching, I can do it. Um, but yeah, I really like the, when, you know, when you're ma doing printmaking, you have, there's this thing that if you're making photography, if you're doing photography and you're in the, dr the dark room, you lose time really easily. Mm. You just kind of go into this other place. I don't hear my tinnitus anymore when it's happening. I'm, you know, fine. That same thing happens with printmaking where, you know, you're, you're there with the ink, you're inking a plate, you're making sure it's right. You're going, you know, putting the paper on, making the paper, soaking the paper. It's very involving. And, um, I like that it, it's transportive. You mentioned the experience in, um, in, in dark rooms. And, and I know we, we didn't really talk about this, but in, in college, I know you really fell in love with photography and that that's something that you personally really love, but I've never really seen you like do anything professionally with photography, I guess. Is that you, you've kind of gone from thing to thing to thing. Like we talked about earlier, why was photography never one of the things that you jumped to? I think I don't, know what makes a good photograph. Mm. I mean, I, I think I love to do it. I love to look at them. Rob, my, my partner is a photographer. He, he, he does it. I think he understands more what makes a good photograph than I do. Um, yeah, I did it a lot in school and it's a much more difficult medium, I think, to, you don't have a lot of control over it, right? It you have to, it's something, if you're doing something in the studio and you're setting it up, you have more control, but mostly it's, you have to find the thing. The thing has to exist in order for you to do it. And that's, that's, that takes the control away. So I've tried things like using pinhole cameras and stuff. And that's very satisfying that takes the control away a bit, but I am really sort of a control freak. So that's, it's sort of the opposite. It's anyway, it's, it's a difficult, I think it's really hard to know what's a good photograph. And so I never felt confident. I'm not confident at all that my photographs are any good. Um, I just like to do it. So as far as the rest of 2021, what is, uh, is it mainly, are you mainly focusing on the mesotent printing and, and is that going to be your, your primary focus or do you have other projects that you have coming up? Well, I have my animation. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Andre yeah. and Potato, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, How did that start? Oh, it started because I thought, well, I've never, I've, I haven't done animation since school, you know, um, like little animation. And I used to do hand drawn animation, like, uh, just very little though, not, not that much of it. Um, maybe 20 years ago or something. And so now you can do, it's easy for you. You're like, you can be your own little studio um, because of the magic of the digital world. And because I have my iPad Pro with Procreate on it and I can make little animations. Um, and I also have, I can do the sound and everything and I can make these little episodes. So I just, I did it was again, I mean, it's again, it's a trend, but it was, a, it was a challenge. You know, I just thought, well, what if, what if I can make something move? How cool would that be? So I just started doing little animations of chairs and things like that. And then, um, then to make myself laugh, I made this little character, a rabbit, um, Andre and did the voice which is this really weird voice that I've done since I was a kid <laughs> and, uh, and turn the voice up a bit. It's not only me, right. It's turned up. The pitch is turned up a bit. Mm. It's not completely me. Um, and it would just like made me laugh and made some of my friends laugh. And so I just kept doing it. So I've got like 25 of them at this point. And now I've started having guest stars on. Um, so I had, 
Steven Weber, who is an, an actor friend of mine, who's just really funny. He said, he said, yes. And I, I was just like, oh my God, I'm mean, actually, so I drew a character for him and he did it. And then I, and then I got this amazing actress, Emma Booth, who's an Australian actress here, who's, she's just beautiful, like just this gorgeous woman. And she's likes Andre and Potato. So she said yes, right away. It's amazing. And it's a really good one. And I've got like six people in, you know, ready to come out. You know, I'm working on Craig Bierko's right now. And I've got like a bunch of people lined up. So I'm really excited. <laughs> That's awesome. It's really fun to do. It's just like really fun. They make me laugh. And, you know, it's not at all these very detailed. It's it's very wiggly and, uh, but it does take forever. So that's, that's kind of on, you know, that's in my wheelhouse. It takes forever. <laughs> does Procreate help with that at all? Other than just having ability to copy images? No. And also I could be, copying the same the same frame over again and then just animating the thing that moves like most people smart people do but i don't i draw every one so that you know and i i copy segments right and bring them over but it's it wiggles because i'm tracing the art every time because it's nice. the ritual of tracing it every time tracing it instead of having just yeah which is ridiculous but it does i think work. it gives a charm i mean it feels more homemade i mean which i think is the point of what yeah. you're trying to do i did try i thought you know what this is stupid i i should just do animate the mouth and the arms and i tried doing it and it didn't feel right it just was like not right you know they need to be <laughs> more rough around the edges <laughs> yeah no, that's really cool awesome awesome well um where can people find you online so they can stay up to date oh i'm easy i'm just Renee French at it's Instagram. I'm just on Instagram at Renee French. Um, I don't really do much on Twitter. It's too mean, you know, it's na <laughs> yeah. nasty over there. It's totally um, gotten that way. Yeah. And I intend to, I'm eventually I'm, I'm thinking of maybe doing a TikTok, but I don't understand it enough. I'm too old um, to understand it. <laughs> but, um, Instagram's my how, yeah, that's my home. You know, I've been on there for a while and that's, it's real. I don't even really have a website. I, I had one, but I, I don't really keep it up because the inst Instagram has it, everything, you know, you can contact me. It's, um, I do look at my DMS also the ones, even the ones in the other box, I do look at them. So if anybody wanted to contact me, they could do that. Awesome. Very cool. So last question, and this is something that I like to ask everybody. Uh, who is one artist that you'd like to see me have on the show? Ooh. Well, I would love if you had Scott Teplin on, because um, I would love to hear him, you know, do an, an interview. He's, 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 uh, he's just really, I, there's so many that I don't, that I don't, I, if I start, then I'll, I'll leave somebody out if it's that kind of thing. But if I were to pick one, it's Scotty. He's, and I, th I think you'd really love his work if you look at it. He's, he's very much, uh, pop surrealist, lowbrow kind of interesting. He, he's gross too. He's gross. <laughs> awesome. Well, Renee, thank you so much for coming on and chatting with me. This was a lot of fun. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having me on here. I'm probably half asleep. I, I, <laughs> I might not remember this tomorrow morning. <laughs> awesome. So cool. So that's it for this episode of Art Affairs. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Renee. One thing that really stood out to me about Renee was how much of a lifelong learner that she is. She's someone who seems like she's, you know, just isn't satisfied and, and maybe even a bit allergic to becoming overly content and is constantly striving to learn new things once she, you know, feels like she's confident and comfortable with something else. So it's almost like, you know, uh, growth by necessity. I think, I, th I think that's super interesting. And most recently, she shifted her focus for, you know, much the same reason towards the mezzotint printing that we talked about and her Andre and Potato animations. 
Be sure to keep an eye on her Instagram to see how her explorations into printmaking are going. Since it definitely seemed like she was wanting the chance to, you know, develop enough of that work for a new exhibition. It'll be fun to see how that all evolves. So thanks again to Renee for joining me today, and thank you for checking out the show. I'm truly grateful for your support. And just a reminder, one big way you could help out if you're really enjoying the show would be to check out the show's new Patreon. You can find all the details on patreon.com slash artifairs. As always, you can contact me through my website at artifairspodcast.com or on Instagram at artifairspodcast. So until next time, be good to yourself and be good to each other. Thank you.